Time now for Iron Africa for headlines. A seven hour shootout in Burkina Faso as authorities carry out a raid on suspected jihadists. It's the latest deadly incident in the wake of several militant attacks. Elsewhere, Benin's president under fire over the death of a nine year old boy as the country scales back on sending patients overseas for medical treatment. We meet one of the world's biggest collectors of African art, who's also a fierce critic of the DRC's president. We start with uh, more bloodshed in Burkina Faso, where three suspected jihadists and one policeman have been killed after a dawn raid on a house in the capital, Ouagadougou. This with the country in the grip of a three-year-old insurgency that so far killed scores of people and driven thousands more from their homes. With details, here's France 24's Nicolas Germain. The operation began at 1.30 in the morning in this villa in the capital Ouagadougou. Neighbours said it lasted several hours. Three suspected jihadists and one member of the security forces were killed. When the shots started, we hid in the corridors to avoid stray bullets, and after about 30 to 40 minutes of firing, there were another 30 to 40 minutes of calm, and that's what was going on. There were three or four rounds of shots being fired, and it was very violent. On March the 2nd, an attack had targeted the army headquarters and the French embassy. Eight people were killed. The security minister said the men shot down on Tuesday had links with the March attacks. Three terrorists presumed had been abattus. Three suspected terrorists were killed. Actually, I think there is no point in calling them suspected terrorists, since they had many weapons which they used to retaliate. Since 2015, Ouagadougou has been targeted by three attacks that have left nearly 60 people dead. And these last three years, the north of the country has been hit even worse. The government says 80 attacks there killed a total of 133 people. Burkina Faso was not targeted when Blaise Compaoré was president. He was toppled in 2014 after nearly three decades in power. On several occasions, the current president, Rochmar Christian Caboret, has accused the Compaoré regime of colluding with jihadist groups. Let's get some more African news in brief now. And officials in the Democratic Republic of Congo say at least two more people have died of the Ebola virus. With at least six new cases reported. That as a vaccination effort enters its second day, a dozen health workers in the northwestern provincial capital of Umbandaka have uh, been treated in a bid to contain the deadly virus. The death toll from the outbreak now stands at 27. Guinea's president, Alpha Conde, has uh, named a new prime minister, Conde loyalist, and former investment minister, Ibrahima Kasori Fafana, replaces Mamadi Yula, who resigned last week. All this at a time of heightened political tension in the country. Ten people died in riots uh, in the capital, Conakry, earlier this year following local elections that the opposition said uh, were marred by fraud. This with Conde's rivals fearing he intends to modify the constitution in order to stand for a third term in 2020. In Somalia, a suicide car bomber has hit a military convoy outside Mogadishu, causing an unknown number of casualties. Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility for the blast in uh, Afgoye, 30 kilometers northwest of the capital. The Al-Qaeda allied militants are fighting to topple the country's western-backed central government and to force out African Union-mandated peacekeepers. In central Nigeria, Catholics have taken to the streets to protest against spiralling violence. This is two priests and 17 worshippers were buried nearly a month after being killed in an attack on their church. All of this is being blamed on nomadic cattle herders clashing with farmers over resources. This battle for land has taken on wider ethnic, religious and political dimensions, which threatened to eclipse even Boko Haram's Islamist insurgency in terms of uh, the security challenges facing the country. To Benin next, where the parents of a nine-year-old boy who died from a blood disease are blaming the president for his fate. This after the government moved to reduce medical evacuations for treatment overseas. Like many Francophone African countries, Benin's public hospitals are often out of date and under-equipped. Our correspondent Emmanuel Londe reports. This mother's distressed plea to the president, broadcast on local television, remains unanswered. What I want is for the government to help me with my child. 
doctors made the request to send Jean-Eude Femi to France for medical treatment eight months ago, after the medical referral centre in Cotonou couldn't treat his blood disease. Before he died, he told me, auntie, help me. I don't want to die. Every time we go to the ministry, they tell us to wait. My son is dead. People are suffering, people are dying at the hospital because of cancer, because of the treatments. Without the help of the government, we can't do anything. Over the last five months, the decision to evacuate the most serious or urgent medical cases abroad has come down to the Beninese president. According to a government report, the reform could save the country around 12 billion CFA francs or more than 18 million euros per year. I am in the process of reforming health care. I have taken a single provider and people responsible for handling the most urgent cases. This will save a lot of money, which will improve the technical facilities. Jean-Eude's uncle took all the administrative steps to save him. His medical records show he'd been successfully treated in South Africa under the former president's regime. But the suspension of medical evacuations to South Africa put a stop to his quarterly checkups, and in just a few months, his health deteriorated. Because of their reforms, meaning that we could no longer receive treatment in South Africa, they killed my son. The authorities did not respond to our request for a comment. Several weeks after his death, it's still not clear if the case of Jean Eudes is one of negligence or whether he's a victim of the economic reforms of Benin's health sector. Finally, we meet one of the world's major collectors of African art and a leading critic of DRC President Joseph Kabila. Sindika de Kolo has recently launched a movement called uh, Les Congolais Debout, or Congolese Stand Up. This from our team at Nicolas Germain, Julian Sauvage, and Sadia Maggio. This is a Ben Alulua statue from the Kasai region in southern Congo. Sindika de Kolo is among the world's major collectors of African art, both classical and contemporary. We met him in a Paris art gallery. Recently, French President Emmanuel Macron asked a commission to look into the possible repatriation of African artifacts that are in France and that were looted during the colonial era. It's a topic that de Kolo has been following closely. The debate shouldn't focus only on the question should these objects be returned or not. We should also look at how to train young people to work in museums, how we can make sure young Congolese have access to this heritage. It's a world heritage, but first of all, it's a Congolese heritage. Sindika de Kolo is also an active member of Congo's civil society. He recently launched his own movement and is increasingly a vocal critic of President Joseph Kabila, whose mandate officially ended in December 2016. I only started this movement. Now it has one and a half million members with a base in Congo. Today what matters is how we stop Mobutu, uh, sorry, Kabila, from achieving his plan. Uh, that was a Freudian slip. Kabila has been in power for 17 years. Mobutu ruled Congo for three decades. In Congo, Dokoro has been sentenced to jail for fraud, but he said the trial was politically motivated. Since then, he has not been to his native country. He denies wanting to enter politics, at least for now. I don't think that it's in politics that I would be the most useful for my country today. Today, but what about in five years? Only time will tell. Dukuro is also a businessman and his wife is Africa's richest woman, Isabel dos Santos. She's the daughter of former Angolan president José dos Santos, who stepped down last year after nearly four decades at the helm of the country. Since then, the new president, Joao Lorenzo, has fired many of dos Santos' closest allies. Isabel dos Santos lost her job as head of the National Oil Company. Her husband is cautious when asked to comment these latest developments. It's justified. He was elected president of the republic. He can therefore choose the people he wants around him to implement his policies. He wants to assert his authority. It's not always easy because his predecessor, President dos Santos, made his mark on the country's history. Now that his father-in-law is no longer Angola's president, Dokolo's influence has waned in neighboring Congo. The question now is whether he will have to stay in exile like his friend, the opposition leader Moïse Katumbi, until Kabila remains in power. And that's it for Iron Africa. Do stay with us here on France 24.
France 24, c'est la richesse de la diversité culturelle mondiale avec un réseau de correspondants à travers la planète. En France 24, en espagnol, communiquons à Latinoamérique avec le monde entier. Rouh mihalia, chahar ou hawahed, hurriyat et tabir. C'est ce qui est France 24. Africa on France 24 is about its people and their stories. Los ciudadanos nos cuentan cuáles son las iniciativas y las problemáticas que tienen en sus comunidades a través del programa Los Observadores. Eso los acerca aún más a France 24.